Welcome to this week's travel history tip. This week's travel tip will take us to the Presidio La Bahia in Goliad, Texas, where we will learn about the history of the chapel, the Presidio itself, and some famous men of Texas history. As we pulled in the parking lot, we saw this beautiful scene. The name given the chapel was Our Lady of Lorento, and it is the oldest building in the compound. Located in the niche above the chapel entrance is a statue of Our Lady of Lorento, sculpted by Lincoln Borglum of Mount Rushmore fame. This centuries-old chapel was where Fannin's men were held during part of their captivity before being massacred, which is a major part of Texas history. The first Declaration of Texas Independence was signed inside the chapel. After the Texas Revolution of 1836, while other buildings of the Presidio fell into neglect and disrepair, the chapel was still used as a place of worship and at one time was temporarily used as a private residence. An act of the Republic of Texas in 1841 restored church properties confiscated by the Republic. It was not until 1855 that the first non-Hispanic bishop of Texas, Bishop J.M. Oden, received title from the town council of Goliad. This is actually the first time that we have come across a situation where the church wasn't open at a mission-type church. Uh, we've been to plenty of missions in California and others in Texas and have never been able to go into the church, but unfortunately for this time, we weren't able to do so. The Goliad State Park and historic site is also found adjacent to the Presidio. This is Zaragoza birthplace site, and here you can read the sign about General Ignacio Zaragoza, a famous Texan. You can also read about Manuel Becerra. He was a citizen under the flags of Spain, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, and the United States. Manuel Becerra bore witness to many of the formative events in Texas history and played a significant role in colonization efforts. You will see the nine flags that flew over Goliad. We proceeded inside. Tons of artifacts that they have in display cases all found there on the grounds. This fort site is where Goliad history began. The location of the fort had been an occupied site long before Spain arrived in the New World. A permanent settlement by Spain began. The town of La Bahia grew up around the protection of the fort. One of the interesting things we saw on the parade grounds in the center of the fort were these trees that had little berries on it. We asked about them and these trees are called anaqua trees and they're found only in this area of Texas. The woman at the counter at the museum, she told us to go feel the leaves. They feel like sandpaper, and indeed they do. And some portions of the walls and the buildings are original, and the Presidio was restored immediately on top of the footprint of the original fort, and original portions of the structures were kept also. Our Lady of Loreto Chapel is the only completely original structure on the site. When President Santa Ana declared the Constitution of 1824 void in 1834, the loyal Texas colonists and many Tejanos began to speak of revolting to have the Constitution reinstated. When it was realized that the Constitution of 1824 would not be reinstated, the colonists, along with some of the Tejanos, would begin a revolution of independence. Throughout the museum, we saw many signs explaining the history of Texas independence. The Battle of Goliad, which occurred here, was the second skirmish of the Texas Revolution. In the early morning hours of October 9, 1835, Texas settlers attacked the Mexican Army soldiers garrisoned at Presidio La Bahia, a fort near the Mexican-Texas settlement of Goliad. La Bahia lay halfway between the only other large garrisons of Mexican soldiers at Presidio San Antonio de Bear and then-important Texas Port of Popano. And again, there are many signs inside the museum explaining the history of the battle at Gonzales, where the famous saying, come and take it, originated. In March of 1836, messengers continued to arrive at Goliad from the Alamo requesting aid. Bannon at Goliad was facing problems of his own. Bannon sent a detachment with wagons to bring them to Goliad. When this detachment was attacked at Refugio, Bannon sent another to assistance. In the meantime, Sam Houston sent news that the Alamo had fallen and ordered Bannon to abandon Goliad and retreat to Victoria. At last, the Texans began their retreat at 9 a.m. on March 19th under a heavy fog. Bannon insisted on taking nine cumbersome artillery pieces of various calibers and about a thousand 
thousand muskets, though he neglected to take enough water and food for more than a few meals. The Texans forfeited about an hour of their lead while crossing the San Antonio River. A cart broke down and the largest cannon fell into the river and had to be fished out. Another valuable hour was lost when Fannin ordered the oxen detached for grazing, and this set up Battle of Coleto. The culmination of the Goliad Campaign of 1836 occurred near Coleto Creek in Goliad County on March 19 and 20, 1836, originally called the Battle of the Prairie. It was one of the most significant engagements of the Texas Revolution. The battle, however, cannot properly be considered as isolated from the series of errors and misfortunes that preceded it, errors for which the Texas commander, James W. Fannin, Jr., was ultimately responsible. The Battle of Coleto lasted until after sunset on March 19th. The Texans made effective use of their bayonets, multiple muskets, and nine cannons. Their square remained unbroken. Dr. Bernard recorded that seven of his comrades had been killed and 60 wounded, 40 severely, Fannin among them. The Mexican general was impressed with both the withering fire of the enemy and their ability to repulse his three charges. Ironically, Urea retired because of ammunition depletion. His casualties were heavy as well. He then positioned snipers in the tall grass around the square and inflicted additional casualties before Texan sharpshooters were able to quell these attacks by firing at the flashes, illuminating the darkness. Ultimately, the Texans under Fannin suffered 10 deaths on March 19th. The able-bodied men were marched out of the fort in three different groups in three different directions and told three different stories about where they were going. When they were about three quarters of a mile from the fort, they were ordered to kneel and were shot. The wounded were killed inside the fort. Colonel Fannin was the last to die. He was taken to the courtyard in front of the chapel near the present-day water gate along the north wall. Blindfolded and seated in a chair because of his leg wound, he made three requests, send his personal possessions to his family, shoot him in the heart and not his face, and give him a Christian burial. He was shot in the face. The soldiers took his personal possessions, and his body was burned, along with many of the others. Some were left where they were killed. About one month after the massacre, Texas General Rusk, which many of you have heard of Rusk, Texas, was following the Mexican army to be sure that they left Texas. General Rusk's men stopped and gathered up the remains of the bodies and buried them on June 3, 1836. Finally, it was the Goliad massacre and not the defeat and surrender at Coleto Creek that soured United States opinion against Mexico and gave Houston, that's General Sam Houston, and the Texas Army the second half of the rallying cry that inspired victory at the Battle of San Jacinto. Remember the Alamo. Remember Goliad. And here's a picture of the Alamo. One of these Saturday travel tips will visit the Alamo. And this is the San Jacinto Monument near Houston, Texas, where the Battle of San Jacinto was fought, which ultimately led to Texas's independence over Mexico. You can go up into the monument and see fantastic views of the area, and in the midground, I guess you would call it, is the Battleship Texas. You may also tour the Battleship Texas, which we have done. On April 21st, 1836, General Sam Houston shouted the encouraging charge, Remember the Alamo. The Texan army rose victorious against Mexican President General Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto, winning the state's independence. East of Houston, San Jacinto Battleground State Historic Site recognizes the birth of the Republic of Texas. The San Jacinto Monument is the biggest in the nation, 15 feet taller than the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. A National Natural Landmark and a National Historic Engineering Landmark, the battleship Texas is the last dreadnought in the world, which means an all-big gunship. The ship was the most powerful weapon in the world and is the only surviving naval vessel to have seen both world wars. On March 2, 1836, at Washington on the Brazos, Near Brenham, the state of Texas declared sovereignty at Independence Hall. There is a great museum there, and you can tour the grounds. And as I close this, I do want to uh, remind everybody that this is Memorial Day weekend. Many people are going to their state capitals or other sites to express their desire for freedom. We are, have learned a little bit about Texas history and those that have died for freedom and for liberty. If you know of a veteran, shake their hand, tell them thank you, and if you have any that have died that you can visit their graves this weekend take a flag we've been told that the boy scouts who have always placed flags on veterans graves throughout the nation have been told they cannot do so this year which is very sad this past week we placed american flags on the grave of both my dad and my stepdad who both served in world war ii i hope you can do the same american history learn it love it appreciate it thank you thank you